Today we're starting our new chapter, which is on the topic of evolution. So we're going to talk a little bit about Darwin's theory of evolution and history of how that uh, came about. Uh, we're going to talk about how populations evolve, and we're going to talk about mechanisms of what's called microevolution. So to introduce our chapter, let's first of all define what we mean by evolution. So evolution just means changes over time. We believe that species change over time. That's, that's really the crux of the theory of evolution, is that there's ancestral species that no longer exist. We see them in fossils, but we can see that there are species today that evolved from those ancestral species, maybe took their place. We know that there's over 1.8 million species on the planet. Um, we haven't identified all of them because there's many things living in places where we haven't necessarily been. And we also know that evolution is still occurring and the environment plays a really big role. As our environment changes, things like global warming, they're affecting the survival of species. What organisms are going to be in the next generation and which ones are going to be gone? So that's a little bit about evolutionary theory. So let's talk a little bit about how it came about, the modern theory of evolution. Well, first of all, prior to the 1800s, people believed the Earth was about 2,000 years old and every single organism on Earth was exactly the same as it had always been. So every, every living thing was created at the same time, and all living things looked exactly the same as they did from the day they were created. There had been no changes at all. Now, some evidence started to come about from different, different people that showed that this thought was not quite right. So James Hutton in 1785, he was a geologist, and what he studied was that rocks took millions of years to change, that there was no way that the Earth could just be 2,000 years old because of the changes that have occurred in the Earth's rock would take way longer than that. They just don't happen that fast. And another guy named George, uh, Charles Lyell, he had a book called Principles of Geology and talked about similar things. He talked about sedimentary rock and that, again, it would take millions of years for rock to build up in these layers and to see a lot of these changes that we see. And so they were the first ones that sort of proposed that based on geology, the Earth was probably much, much older than just 2,000 years. Now, the first guy that has a hypothesis about evolution, John Baptiste Lamarck, he was actually wrong. He's kind of known for being wrong, but he's also known for having kind of putting his first idea out there. Now, what he said was organisms move towards perfection. And on the surface, this makes sense. Well, organisms, you know, they get better and better so they can survive in their environment. That sort of sounds okay. Um, he also said that if they used their bodies, they could alter them, which is actually true. If you work out, you get muscles. So he was saying, though, Things like giraffes could make their necks longer by stretching them. So if the leaves on the trees became scarce, the giraffes could stretch their necks, and the more they stretched them, the longer they would get. Um, and then, and here's where it really falls apart, that organisms could pass these acquired characteristics to their offspring. So he would say that because the giraffes stretched their necks and made their necks longer, their babies would have longer necks. Uh, that would be like saying, because I work out, my babies are going to come out really buff. Um, or because I lost three fingers in an accident, my babies are going to be born missing three fingers. We know today, because of genetics, which they did not know about during his time, we know this doesn't happen, that organisms do not pass on acquired characteristics. They only pass on genetic traits. And so this is where his hypothesis kind of fell apart once we knew more about genetics. So that's Lamarck. Um, he would say the giraffe of today got their, got their next... Uh, long, like they are today, from years and years of stretching their necks. So the more they stretched it, the longer it got. They had babies. The babies had even longer necks because their parents stretched their necks, and that's how we ended up with the modern-day giraffe. Now, Charles Darwin, everybody's heard of him because he's kind of considered the father of evolution, but he came up with a, a theory that we still believe today, and so this is um, why he's given so much credit. So he was born in 1809, and he was a naturalist. He studied nature. And he was brought along on a ship called the Beagle, the HMS Beagle, on an expedition. And he went to the Galapagos Islands specifically, um, which you can see on this little map here. And he published a book um, called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And his book was sort of about, it was, it was about something he called natural selection. So let's talk about his theory of natural selection. This is just a bigger picture to show you the Galapagos Islands. It's really serendipitous that that's where he went because those islands, because they're tiny and they're kind of far from each other, he saw all kinds of evolution. So what he saw 
Specifically, he saw many, for example, many species of tortoises. He saw many species of finches, many species of iguanas, that, and uh, more than you would necessarily see like around you right now because of the, the nature of the Galapagos Islands. He also found that they all seemed to be related to each other. Even though they were separate species, meaning they didn't mate with each other and make offspring together, they were di distinct. Um, they seemed to have, like, almost like they could have come from a common ancestor. Uh, and the finches are a really good example, like this picture here. Those are four different species of finches. Their beaks are somewhat different. They're different sizes. Their feet are actually somewhat different. But they also look like they share similarities. Like maybe way, way, way back in the past, there was a common ancestor to these species. He actually found fossils because there was a lot of sedimentary rock, like cliff sides. And he could actually see fossils of, say, tortoises, for example, that no longer existed on the islands. But they looked very similar to the ones that did exist. Not exactly the same, like, like almost like the older species had become extinct and the newer species that existed today was similar, but not exactly the same. So he, he also noticed, very important, that these organisms had adaptations that helped them survive specifically in their different environments. So they lived in different areas, like for example, some finches lived in the forest, some lived in the cliffs, some lived on the beach, and the ones in the forest had different beaks than the ones on the beach because they ate different food. So it kind of made sense that they were adapted or they had characteristics that helped them survive in the specific areas where they lived. So here's what he basically said. He said, you know what? There's genetic variation, meaning the variations are already there. You don't acquire them during your lifetime. If you're a bird and you're living on the beach, you're not going to turn tan to blend with the beach. You're born with whatever color feathers you're going to have. So genetic, but genetically, some birds were lighter, some were darker, some had long beaks, some had short beaks. That, so that was the first thing he said. The second thing he said is more organisms are born that are going to actually survive to adulthood and reproduce, which we know to be true today. If you go to a population, mice have like 16, 18 babies at a time. In nature, if every single one of those babies survived, there'd be no room for anything else on the planet except mice. Um, so we know that not every baby that's born survives. Not every seed that's released by a tree grows into a new tree. Only some of those seeds happen to land in places that are good for growth and then have the characteristics to help them survive in that environment. And so what he said was, in addition to that, not only are there more born that are going to live, there's competition for basic needs. So there's not enough food, water, shelter, mates to go around for everybody. There's a struggle for survival. And his conclusion from this is who's going to survive? If you have 10 babies, who's going to be the one that's going to make it? Well, he said that the ones that are going to make it are probably going to be the ones that have the best adaptations. Those are going to be the ones that are going to tend to survive longer. Now, is that always true? No, right? A storm could hit and some of the babies just die just because, not because they're, they're worse off, just they just were in the wrong place at the wrong time. But in his theory, because there are other things that cause changes in populations, but he was specifically leading up to a specific thing that causes evolution, which is natural selection. And he said the ones with the best adaptations are going to live longer and reproduce more. And he called this fitness. Be careful with that word fitness, because when we think of fitness, we think of like physical fitness. Oh, if you are like strong, you're physically fit, so you have high fitness. In evolution, that's not what that word means. In biology, an organism with high fitness is an organism that has lots of babies. They have, they have good genes, and they pass those genes on. So maybe the bird that blends with the environment better, he lives longer because predators don't see him. Therefore, because he lives longer, he has more time to mate with, uh, with females and pass on his genes. And then the next generation probably looks very similar to him because they inherited the genes from their dad. So that's fitness, the ability to pass on your genes. If you live a long time but don't have any babies, you would not be considered someone with high fitness. If you're strong because you go to the gym, that doesn't mean you have high fitness. And so what he said was the giraffes didn't get long necks because they stretched their necks. He said, you know what? The giraffes had a variety of neck lengths. Some had long necks, some had shorter necks. But if having a long neck helped you to survive, and that was a genetic trait, you are going to probably get to mate with more females, pass that trait on. More babies are going to be more with long necks. The ones with shorter necks are not going to survive as well. And so over time, more and more and more of the giraffes would have the long necks. And he called this survival of the fittest, or the fancy word you probably know, 
natural selection. So that's what natural selection is. Now, it is not the only cause of evolution. There's all kinds of other things. Mutations. If a mutation happens, then a new trait may appear in a population. If, um, if there's migration, if new organisms come in or leave, that's going to change who's around to mate with who. That can cause evolution to happen. If there's some kind of natural disaster and a whole bunch of organisms die, that's going to cause changes to happen. Um, however, the one thing that typically leads to changes that help an organism survive is going to be natural selection. So because sometimes if a mutation happens, it could be good, it could be bad, you know, it's just new. We don't really know if that's going to be a good or bad mutation. But natural selection is specifically when evolution ends up leading to organisms that have specific adaptations that help them survive in their particular environment. And so he also called his theory descent with modification. Descent, as in the offspring, come out with different modifications, meaning uh, new combinations of genes from their parents. And again, adaptations accumulate over time. So the organisms become better fit for their environment through natural selection. So scientists uh, consider this a theory. This is not a hypothesis because, number one, it's talking about something much bigger than just a hypothesis would talk about. And it's supported by a huge body of evidence. We have all kinds of evidence, which we're going to talk about in our next lecture, that supports that natural selection happens. It definitely happens over periods of time where organisms become more fit to their environment. And so Darwin would say, again, about the giraffes, he would have said, look, the giraffes, there was a variety of neck lengths already in the giraffes. They didn't get longer necks by stretching them. Genetically, some had longer necks, some had shorter necks. But if evolution favored, if the environment, I should say, that they were living in favored having a long neck, maybe there was a drought for several years and the best leaves were high up in the trees, then the ones with the shorter necks were probably not going to survive and reproduce. So they're not going to pass on that gene for the short neck the ones with the longer necks are going to pass their genes on, and over time, you're going to end up with populations of giraffes where there aren't any short neck ones anymore. Like, that trait is just gone. And it's because of who got to mate and pass their genes on, not because a, a giraffe itself with a short neck turned into a giraffe with a long neck. So that's where we're going to stop. Actually, I want to show you one more slide. These are Darwin's, what we call Darwin's finches. Um, so he basically found fossils of this ancestral finch that existed. Um, and what he found was these are actually the living finches. There were something like 13 species of finches. You can't read this. It's too blurry. Uh, but depending on where they live, look, vegetarian, insect eating, woodpecker-like, ground finches, cactus finches, warbler-like, the uh, warblers sing. Um, so depending on um, where they lived, what he would have said happened over time is that this ancestral finch had some of these characteristics. There was a range of bigger beaks, smaller beaks, darker bodies, lighter bodies, bigger finches, smaller finches. And these finches got spread over, remember the Galapagos Islands are all these islands that are kind of far apart. And he's saying, what if these finches all got kind of scattered on these different islands? Some of them lived in areas where it was rocky. Some of them lived in areas where it was forest. Some of them lived on the beach. Depending where they lived, a trait that was good in one spot might be bad in another spot. And so over periods of time, each of these sort of diverged into different species. Now, technically, you would also need things like mutations because probably, you know, not all of these traits were here in the ancestor. Uh, some of these could have come about randomly by mutations, but a lot of this would have been because of natural selection. This is the Galapagos tortoise. There's actually many species of Galapagos tortoises, and the marine iguanas uh, he also witnessed in the, in the islands. But the finches is probably the one, uh, that's the one he's typically most famous for, is discovering all of these. There's a, a specific name for what happened with the finches called adaptive radiation, which we're not really going to get into, but it has to specifically do with when this kind of thing happens on an island chain and you end up with many species. We actually see this in the Hawaiian Islands. There's uh, birds called honey creepers, and there's many, many species of them, and we think it was a similar situation where they got scattered over these islands and each sort of became adapted to their particular environment.